Ladies and gentlemen, are we ready to start? I welcome everyone here. I'm Brian Atwood. I'm a senior fellow at the Watson Institute, and I guess I was asked to do this by Paul Butler, the editor of the Brown Journal on World Affairs, um, because I, my path has crossed with Kevin Rudd when he was foreign minister in 2010. We were just talking about that. Um, but I, I uh, am very, very pleased and privileged to be able to introduce the former Prime Minister of Australia. Um, uh, in doing a little research for this introduction, I realized that I could be speaking until 1.30 just to describe all of the things that he's done in his life. <clears throat> Suffice it to say that as Prime Minister uh, from 2007 to 2010, uh, he got a lot done, and uh, he then became foreign minister and then prime minister again. Uh, but his first act, I think, is very significant, and it's some messages here for an American audience, I think, as well. His first act was to ask the parliament uh, to pass a resolution apologizing for the way it treated the ind indigenous peoples uh, of uh, Australia, the so-called stolen generation. He went on uh, to be confronted by the, the international financial crisis of 2008 and brought Australia through with unscathed, virtually, the only Western country that really didn't suffer from that financial crisis. He's been a very strong supporter of climate change. Um, he made sure that uh, Australia ratified the Kyoto Accords. He was very active even after he left uh, his official position in uh, supporting a group of people from Asia and the United States and elsewhere for the 2020 conference in Copenhagen. And that conference, which was seen as not quite a success, would have been even worse, a worse failure and would not have set up uh, the COP uh, series uh, to succeed as well as they did in Mexico if it hadn't if they hadn't been for his efforts. Uh, he's been a strong supporter of development assistance, and that's where our paths had crossed uh, when he was in Busan, and he managed uh, through his work there to gain clarification as to the position of the Chinese government. What I like about him <coughs> is not so much his political career, but he started, as I did, as a diplomat and served uh, as a diplomat for Australia in both Beijing and Stockholm before he left and became involved in politics. Some of the people in opposition in Australia say he wasn't very diplomatic on occasion in the way he confronted them, <laughs> uh, but uh, he now is a visiting professor at Tsinghua University. He's the uh, president of the Asia Society Policy Institute he has worked with CSIS. He's done a, a study for the JFK School at Harvard. By the way, Tsinghua University is the Brown University of Beijing. If you, someone wanted me to call it the Harvard University of Beijing, but I, it's the Brown University of Beijing. Um, so without any further ado, he's going to tell us uh, about um, what's going on now in China, what we can expect as we move forward, with a trade war or other issues that we're confronting China on. And uh, without any further ado, the, the former Prime Minister of Australia, Kevin Rudd. Well, thank you very much for that very warm <clears throat> Providence, Rhode Island welcome. I've not been to Providence before. I've been to Rhode Island before, and I've not been to Brown before. So this is all a novel experience for me. So please forgive me in advance if I demonstrate demonstrable Australian cultural insensitivity <laughs> about something. So. Thank you, Brian, for the kind introduction. And I did um, spend some time with Brian <clears throat> at uh, an important, and I think historically important, international aid conference of the Development Assistance Committee held in Busan in the Republic of Korea, I think 2011-2012 uh, from memory. It was the occasion when uh, China was seeking to obtain status uh, under the Development Assistance Committee uh, for the legitimacy of its international aid efforts in the world. Um, 
and many of us had a strong view that if that was going to occur, we had to see maximum transparency applied to China's international aid efforts from that time on. And that was very much the nature of the intense debate in which we were engaged at that conference. Thank you also, Paul Butler, esteemed editor of the August Journal. The Brown Journal of World Affairs. Uh, I presume it's not yellow journalism, but it's, uh, it's uh, the Brown Journal. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and for the contribution which the journal makes to uh, the serious discussion of international relations theory and practice in the world today. Watson also has itself uh, a proud institutional history for looking at the world's great challenges through an interdisciplinary lens. I've been asked today to talk about uh, the rise of Xi Jinping and Xi Jinping's worldview. By background, I'm a China guy. Uh, when I was at uh, university, back in the Mesolithic period, uh, I uh, studied uh, five years of Chinese language, modern, classical, history, politics, economics, literature, art. Uh, I'm the definition of an area studies guy, which means I don't know much about anything else. Uh, so, but as the world then unfolded uh, in the decades since then, having some familiarity about how China views the world has been of some assistance in my engagement with China, either as a scholar, as a businessman, as a uh, bureaucrat, as a diplomat, as a foreign minister and as a prime minister, and now back to the beginning of the, the food chain as a scholar once again. Uh, so. Uh, for those of you who are taking the study of China seriously, uh, I would commend you just put in the years uh, to understand the world as seen from Beijing out and not just from outside in. <clears throat> in international relations, uh, like anyone's national politics, understanding how the other guy thinks and why they think that way is very much the beginning of wisdom. The beginning of wisdom in understanding China's view of the world is to understand China's view of itself. And given that Xi Jinping is at the apex of the Chinese political system, it's important that we have a good understanding of how he sees his country, his party, and China's place in the world. We've reached something of a tipping point in the evolution of Chinese politics since the return of Deng Xiaoping at the third plenum of the 11th Central Committee uh, in November of 78. There has been a tacit assumption, at least across much of the collective West, over the last 40 years that China, step by step, was embracing the global liberal capitalist project. Certainly, there was a view that Deng Xiaoping's program of reform and opening, uh, uh, would liberalize the Chinese economy with a greater role for market principles and a lesser role for the Chinese state in the economy. A parallel assumption uh, has been that over time this would produce liberal democratic reforms across the country, which would gradually reduce the authoritarian powers of the Chinese Communist Party, create a greater plurality of political voices within the country, and in time involve something not dissimilar to a Singaporean-style guided democracy, albeit on a grand scale. Despite the global wake-up call that was Tiananmen in 1989, by and large this continued to be the underlying view across much of the collective West that China, through many twists and turns, was still broadly on track to create a more liberal political system, if not to create any form of classical Western liberal democracy. That was always, in my view, a misguided view. But the rise of Xi Jinping should not be interpreted simplistically as a sudden triumph of authoritarianism over democracy for the future of China's domestic political system. Rather, it should be seen as a definition of the particular form of authoritarianism that China's new leadership now seeks to entrench. I see this emerging political system as having three defining characteristics. First, the unapologetic assertion of the power, prestige and prerogatives of the Chinese Communist Party apparatus over and above the administrative machinery of the Chinese state. In previous decades, the role of the party apparatus had shrunk to a more narrowly defined ideological role. 
the powers of detailed policy decision making had gradually migrated to the institutions of the State Council. This indeed had been the signature reform under Premier Zhu Rongji when he was still in office. That is no longer the case. Xi Jinping has realised that if you remove the party as an institute, institution from continued structural relevance to the country's real political decision making processes, the party over time will literally fade away. As a person who believes deeply not just in the party's history, um, but also in the party's future, she has not been prepared to stand idly by while that happened. She has now decided to intervene decisively to reverse this trend. A second defining feature of this new authoritarian period is the role of political ideology over pragmatic policy. For the previous 40 years, we've been told that China's governing ideology was socialism with Chinese characteristics. As the decades rolled by, at least in the economy, there was much less socialism, however, than there were Chinese characteristics. In this sense, Chinese char characteristics became the accepted domestic political euphemism for good old capitalism. Few people seem to have understood that a core part of Xi Jinping's intellectual makeup is that he is by training a Marxist dialectician. This derives from the Hegelian principles of thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, or in the Chinese Maoist terms, contradictions among the people. This forms a deep part of Xi Jinping's intellectual software. Indeed, the importance which Xi Jinping attaches to this as an intellectual methodology led him to conduct two formal Politburo study sessions on both historical materialism and dialectical materialism in 2013 and 2015, respectively. As a dialectician, Xi Jinping is acutely conscious of the new social, economic, and political forces being created by China's neoliberal economic transformation. He would also understand intuitively the challenges which these new forces would, over time, represent to the party's continuing Leninist hold on power. And both he and the rest of the central leadership have read their development economics. They understand it. They're not deaf. They're not dumb. They know what the international literature says, that demands for political liberalisation almost universally arise once per capita income passes a certain threshold. That is the learning from the academy. They are therefore deeply aware of the profound contradiction, or Mao Dun, uh, which exists between China's national development priority of escaping the income, middle income trap on the one hand, and unleashing parallel demands for political liberalisation once incomes continue to rise on the other hand. Xi Jinping's response to this dilemma has been a reassertion of ideology. This has meant a reassertion of Marxist-Leninist ideology and a new prominence accorded to ideological education across the entire Chinese system. But it's more sophisticated than a simple unidimensional ideological response. At least the t since the 2008 Olympics, which predated Xi Jinping's ascendancy, Chinese nationalism has also become a parallel mainstay in China's broader ideological formation. This has continued and expanded under Xi Jinping and has been augmented by an infinitely more sophisticated propaganda apparatus across the country, which now fuses the imagery of the Chinese Communist Party on the one hand and the Chinese nation into a combined Chinese contemporary political consciousness. On top of this, we've also seen a rehabilitation of a form of Chinese Confucianism as part of the restoration of Chinese historical narratives about and the continuing resonance of China's unique national political forms. According to the official line, this historical, authoritarian, hierarchical continuity is what has differentiated China from the rest of the world throughout history. And why should it change in the future? This Chinese neo-Confucianism is regarded by the party as a comfortable historical accompaniment to the current imperatives for a strong modern Chinese state necessary to manage the complex processes of the great Chinese renaissance of the future. The shorthand form of the political narrative is simple. China's historical greatness across its dynastic histories lay in strong authoritarian hierarchical Confucian states. By corollary, 
China's historical greatness has never been the product of a Western-style liberal democracy. By further corollary, China's future national greatness will lie not in any adaptation of Western political forms, but instead through the modern adaptation of its own indigenous political legacy in the form of a Confucian communist state. This brings us to the question of the nature of China's, or more specifically, Xi Jinping's worldview. This term has a long and complex history in the West, worldview, Xi Jiaquan. But arguably a more recent and narrower definition in its contemporary Chinese translation. In the West, the term worldview comes from the German Weltanschauung, uh, which was first used, albeit fleetingly, by Kant in 1790, before undertaking a long conceptual evolution through Hegel, Kierkegaard, Heidegger, Marx, Engels, and even Freud. For Kant, this term Weltanschauung meant simply our perception of the world as mediated by the senses. Hegel took Kant's concept further by incorporating into his idealist understanding of human progress through the dialectical processes of thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. Hegel also conceived of different individual and national worldviews, laying the early conceptual groundwork for Chinese theorists of Deng Xiaoping's generation and their idea of socialism with Chinese characteristics as an epistemological means of breaking the ideological stranglehold of universal communist orthodoxy. The impact of Leninist, Stalinist and later Soviet conceptualizations of a Marxist worldview on the newly formed Chinese Communist Party were profound. But starting from 1945, we see a series of concerted efforts by Chinese Marxist theorists to liberate Chinese Marxism from what they increasingly perceived as the shackles of Soviet ideological dogma. This culminated in the post-1978 period of socialism with Chinese characteristics under Deng Xiaoping, as the party sought to grapple with a new set of theoretical challenges arising from the leadership's decision to turn much of remaining Marxist orthodoxy on its head, embracing the demands of pro-market reforms at home, as well as comprehensive engagement of the international product, service and capital markets abroad. Whereas the content of the Chinese Communist Party's official worldview may therefore have changed significantly over the last century of the party's history, including in this new period, Xin Shidai, of Xi Jinping's leadership and thought, what is remarkable is that the Marxist methodological framework through which these worldviews have been developed has remained formally intact. So while Marxist dialectics may have died their official death in Russia with the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, they remain alive and well in the Chinese Communist Party worldview of the 21st century. What's the relevance, therefore, uh, or the irrelevance of international relations theory today in seeking to understand what is happening with the China of the 21st century? An analysis of China's role in the world, including how its leaders conceive of that role, cannot escape the deep debates that also permeate the general literature on social science research in the West. It may well be that either realist, liberal internationalist, or even Marxist theoretical frameworks help explain certain elements of China's changing policies towards the world. It's worth reflecting on what <clears throat> the tradition has to offer in helping understand China's future trajectory. Let's look at realism. Western realist, neo-realist, or so-called structural realist frameworks for interpreting China's worldview and the strategic policy settings that flow from it are plentiful in supply. This applies to both so-called offensive and defensive variations of realist theory. The principal standard bearer for the offensive realist view of China's international strategy is John Mearsheimer from the University of Chicago. This is stated most starkly in Mearsheimer's 2014 edition of his book, The Tragedy of Great Power Politics, which dedicates its concluding chapter to proving, his term, not mine, that China, irrespective of the public ideation advanced by its leaders on the question of China's emerging capabilities and intentions, provides just one further gloomy example of what every great power seeks to do, namely, to maximize its share of world power and to eventually dominate the system." Unquote. That's Mearsheimer's analysis. <clears throat> 
What does liberal internationalism have to say on the question of China's rise? Of course, this is the principal alternative theoretical discourse for explaining China's evolving international engagement. Liberalism, neoliberalism, or liberal institutionalism, as it's sometimes called. Whereas liberalism differs from realism in its underlying Kantian proposition that interests can be secured not just through self-help, power maximization, the balance of power and where necessary war, but rather through rational decisions in support of peaceful cooperation, the development of an international rules-based system, ultimately anchored in liberal democratic politics, open markets, and international institutions that give systemic effect to these liberal values. What of the third school of international relations theory which might be applied to China, beyond realism and beyond liberalism, namely Marxism itself or structuralism? I've already discussed today the significance of the core Marxist analytical methodologies of historical and dialectical materialism in the construction of Chinese official worldviews. <clears throat> As noted earlier, in a world of socialism with Chinese characteristics, the party's use of Marxist methods of analysis does not necessarily equate with classically Marxist conclusions about the state of the international order or China's role in changing it. But this raises the question that even if China, which continues to formally uphold the orthodoxy of Marxism, Leninism and Mao Zedong thought, no longer sees itself bound by any particular Marxist conclusions on international relations theory or practice, then does a Marxist framework any longer hold true for understanding anything of what Xi Jinping himself actually thinks about what China should be doing in the world today? This brings us to a fourth school of international relations. As a theoretical framework for analyzing both the rise of China and its changing relationship with the international order, beyond the familiar narratives of realist despair and neoliberal hope, constructivism offers a number of positive interpretive possibilities. These include the influence of culture in forming shared or non-shared understandings between states. Indeed, Chinese international relations theorists have also contended that a constructivist approach may be a framework capable of harmonizing Chinese and American approaches to international relations theory through concepts such as relationality in shaping common futures through mutually constructed <coughs> international realities. What of the English school? My view is that in understanding the China's changing worldview, uh, we are now in deeply uncertain, perhaps unique conceptual terrain both in theoretical terms, but also in interpreting the complex dynamics of China's international policy practice. Under Xi Jinping, China's engagement with its neighboring security challenges has been deeply realist. Its engagement, however, with the prevailing international liberal political, economic, and environmental orders has varied. Illiberal on the first, mixed on the second, and recently internationalist on the third. We also see a constructivist China as it seeks to fully engage the existing global multilateral institutions, negotiating new norms in some, while also creating or constructing new institutions outside the current liberal order in others. Regionally, there is an even more intense constructivist dynamic at work, where competing Chinese and American regionalisms are in contention, shaped by a combination of realist security dynamics and an increasingly beleaguered liberal internationalism struggling to underpin open regional markets against the forces of nationalism, protectionism, and mercantilism. I argue that the virtue of the English School of International Relations as a theoretical model as applied to both East Asian regional realities as well as China's growing global role offers a credible via media, a third way, between competing claims to the theoretical hegemony. The English school recognizes basic realist concepts, including the anarchical society and the balance of power, but it also tempers these with the proposition of a negotiated international society of values, norms, and rules, which can be constructed between states to militate against the excesses of realism in one direction, while falling short of the ideals of an all-embracing, watertight, liberal, inst institutionalist order in the other.
Equally importantly, the English school recognises the critical domestic drivers of China's bolder view of its place in the region and the world. If Chinese area studies is to teach us anything about China's worldview, it is the enduring importance of culture, history and ideation in shaping the international behaviours of its political elites over time. The English school has adapted to global realities beyond its formative foundation in European high politics of the 19th century, provides a rounded, inclusive embrace of both sets of external and internal factors currently at work in shaping Xi Jinping's emerging worldview. What I've provided here today is a very simple survey of a much more complex reality of a contending international relations theoretical frameworks, trying to make sense of the 21st century reality, but not for the intellectual delectation of the academy, but as a guide for policymakers as well. It's why I have recently myself undertaken my own research program on Xi Jinping's worldview, Xi Jinping the Shi Guan, through the Oxford University China Center. So for me, this is very much a work in intellectual progress. In my remaining time before we take questions in our seminar today, let me reflect in summary of form, given the theoretical discussion that we've just engaged in, on what I see to be the seven concentric circles of Xi Jinping's worldview. These are not remarkable. These are quite simple. But I think best explained through the theoretical paradigm that I have just run through. Number one, in terms of Xi Jinping's Maslowian hierarchy of needs, in other words, what lies at the center of his seven circles or concentric circles of uh, worldview is the paramount importance of the party and the party continuing in power. We should never understand, underestimate that in our Western analysis of China today. It's not a party which is fading away. It is a party which is with a strong and robust future in Xi Jinping's mind. According to that worldview, therefore, the continued political power and legitimacy of the Chinese Communist Party remains foundational and central to any worldview he has about China's role in the world today. The second concentric circle <coughs> lies with holding the country together. The Chinese historical tradition teaches Chinese leaders that good emperors hold the empire together Bad, ineffective or weak emperors allow the empire to fall apart. The enduring lesson of Chinese dynastic history. How that translates into Chinese modern politics and into current worldviews uh, is that anyone who is a leader of China today who embraces any policy which could see either Xinjiang, Tibet or Taiwan or any other core claim to Chinese territorial integrity including the South China Sea slide away loses legitimacy against this core historical imperative in China's worldview, in Xi Jinping's worldview. The third is this, in concentric circles, is the importance to deploy an economic policy which raises the living standards of the Chinese people to restore the legitimacy of the Chinese Communist Party, which in the past delivered the Chinese people not only the chaos of the Cultural Revolution, but also the economic devastation prior to that of the Great Leap Forward. And therefore, in terms of the future legitimacy of the Chinese Communist Party and its claim to political power, absent the ballot box, is to continue to deliver through one form of economic stratagem after the other, continued rises in Chinese living standards, but at the same time, the fundamental economic machinery which delivers a powerful Chinese international state. The fourth in these concentric circles in Xi Jinping's worldview is the flip side of the third. Not only to raise China's uh, living standards for each of its people, to liberate not only 600 million people from poverty, an extraordinary achievement in itself, and to increase the aggregate economic power of the Chinese state as a consequence, but to do so in a manner which still enables the Chinese people to breathe clean air, to have clean water, and also to be able to plant crops in soil which has not been terminally contaminated. The environmental conditionalities which we now have 
assumed as part of the overall development project around the rest of the world have more recently come to China. Public critique of the legitimacy of the Chinese Communist Party as being responsible through its breakneck speed of economic development over the last 30 to 40 years with an unsustainable environmental cost has caused the party in the last 10 years, and the last five in particular, to haul up the red flag, literally, and to say, unless we can deliver substantively sustainable environmental development, then frankly we lose our legitimacy as well. Environmental sustainability, therefore, is not just a cute expression. It is seen axiomatically as part and parcel of the long-term survival, the credibility of the Chinese party and state. It affects the well-being fundamentally of the people. Sustaining the analogy of concentric circles, the fifth of these concentric circles has to do with China having sufficient geopolitical space along its maritime eastern frontier. And that's where China runs into another frontier state with maritime capabilities, namely this one, the United States of America. This is where the two spheres of, shall we say, worldview <coughs> radically coincide and come into conflict with each other. The Chinese in this worldview uh, resent, given their historical experience of having been subjugated by the Japanese uh, during the period from 1895 to 1945, the idea that their own maritime strategic perimeter should be controlled by others. And as a consequence, China in this worldview does not accept the legitimacy of continuing Ameri American alliance structures in East Asia and the West Pacific, most notably with the Republic of Korea, most notably with Japan, but other US allies as well, including Thailand, the Philippines, and Australia. Furthermore, consistent with that element of uh, Xi Jinping's and China's worldview, the continuing forward presence of, US, of the US armed forces in the Western Pacific, uh, west of Hawaii, but including uh, the Aleutians, Guam, Okinawa, and other US basing entitlements, again, from the Chinese perspective, is seen as being undermining China's long-term future strategic stability across its maritime frontier. China's strategy, therefore, in securing its eastern maritime frontier over time is to gradually but effectively push America back, gradually but effectively to fragment America's alliance structures in that part of the world. And to do so with a level of increasing military capability, but underneath it all, to do so with the overwhelming power of its economic presence, the political influence which derives from that presence, and the foreign policy persuasion which comes from the same. Number six in this seven part uh, set of concentric circles of China's worldview, or Xi Jinping's worldview, has been more recently developed and articulated since Xi Jinping came to power. It's the consolidation of China's western continental frontier. Hence, we see the unfolding of what has happened now with One Belt, One Road, what we've seen with the further consolidation of the institutional machinery which already exists across uh, Western China and into Central Asia and beyond, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and the Loose Security Confederation called SICA. China again seeks through its overwhelming economic diplomacy and the presence of its investments on the, on the ground and the new connectivities to be opened up by the One Belt, One Road initiative to create a wide corridor zone and in fact Eurasian continent uh, where China's economic footprint becomes dominant. There's a strategic logic underpinning this. It's because the other threats to China's own territorial integrity in history have been delivered by continental corridors either from the north or from the west, either from the Manchurians, either from the Mongols, either from the Xiongnu in an earlier period in Chinese history, uh, or from Central Asia. Therefore, a deep Chinese strategic sense of having a comfortable strategic perimeter to its western continental uh, self uh, constitutes this sixth of the Chinese concentric circles, which I argue are part and parcel 
of Xi Jinping's worldview. The seventh and final is this. It is China's place in the world at large, China's place in the future of the international rules-based system, China's place in what we call the international rules-based order. Since 1945, the order as we describe it is based on two fundamental factors. One, American power as the principal victor of the Second World War, both in the Atlantic and the Pacific. Although the securing of that victory depended in large part in Asia on China pinning down most of Japan's forces within the, the Japanese occupation of China, just as it did in Europe with the Soviet Union pinning down most German forces uh, to the east of Berlin, not to the west. Nonetheless, the United States emerged as the overall victor and contributed itself significantly to that outcome, as we know from the history of both the uh, European and Pacific wars. As a result, <clears throat> America emerged in terms of its conventional armaments and initially through its nuclear armaments as the dominant global military power. After the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, America entered its unipolar moment. But quite apart from the existence of objective American hard power, the United States also in the post-war period built a structure of international relations around the United Nations system, around the Bretton Woods institutions, around the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, which collectively constituted what we have called the international rules-based system. These two are inseparable, American un power underpinning it, but a rules-based system which at the same time in part became freestanding. So when we look at the seventh of these concentric circles of China's worldview and its priorities about where it wants to go, it is simply along these lines that the assumption that many have had in the collective West that this international rules-based system based on the institutions that we evolved in the period 45 through to 48 and beyond and the continuation of American unipolar power is not from China's perspective necessarily the guaranteed way of the future. China's critique is simple. It says we were not part of the Victors Conference in 1944 or 45 or 48. That was a bunch of you white guys basically. Former colonial powers or in the case of China the nationalist government not the communist government. As a consequence China concludes that it was not a principal stakeholder in the setting up of the system. China also concludes, however, that the system as it's evolved has by and large since China's admission first to the UN in 1971 and then later to the World Trade Organization has been enormously beneficial for China's own long-term political, international political and economic evolution and the rise domestically in China's living standards through the enormous role played through China's access to global trade markets afforded to it through most favoured nation status arising from its membership of the WTO, which the US itself supported. But now we arrive at a different reality, when sometime in the next decade, the Chinese economy will be larger than that of America's, and in the next three decades, the aggregate size of China's military may well equate that of the United States as well. This remains to be seen. And so now we're in a period of contestation. We are in a period where China also seeks to argue there may be alternative forms which need to be embraced in terms of the future rules-based system, which are more consistent with China's own values at home. And where we see the friction point arising most readily on this at present is of course in the future operation of the Human Rights Commission in Geneva, where China has a radically different view of what constitutes human rights compared with the West, but also frictions in other domains as well. It will be a complex process, but in China's evolving worldview under Xi Jinping, this seventh and outer circle of what happens with the future of the global rules-based order is now one of active engagement as well, with an uncertain destination. I thank you for your attention, and I look forward to our discussion today. Thank you very much. Uh, I particularly appreciate your uh, relating some of the classic political science theories to uh, 
the realities on the ground and, and China's uh, attitudes toward those and where they fit with respect to these mostly Western developed uh, political theories. Uh, I, this is not to challenge you, but I can recall maybe 15 years ago hearing the great environmentalist Lester Brown talking about the challenges that China faces with respect to water tables, um, food, um, energy, uh, all of those things that uh, mean basically that China has to engage with the rest of the world because they can't produce enough for their population as it is. Um, Ken Eichelberry, who's an inter liberal internationalist, mm -hmm. has written very eloquently a few years ago, and maybe Xi has caused this to be old news, but basically that China um, needs the international system and must engage in it, and, and uh, that was one of the rationales for joining the World Trade Organization. Now you have uh, a situation um, caused partially by the United States and President Trump's attitude toward the WTO, his attitude toward trade, um, that is challenging some of these rules-based organizations that China has taken some advantage of. Um, there have been two rulings at the WTO, one in favor of China and one against China, but China has been pretty deferential to that international organization, whereas it would appear in using a national security rationale uh, to raise tariffs, uh, the United States is looking for loopholes in that organization, and indeed the President hasn't made any secret of the fact that he doesn't particularly like the WTO. Um, Graham Allison recently came back from uh, China and wrote an article indicating that these trade wars could produce real conflict, and in particular, I suppose, in the, the South China Sea. Um, I don't know. I mean, it seems to me that one of the two cultural characteristics, this would be a constructivist view of the, of the world, that China is a lot more patient than the United States when it comes to making decisions. And I suppose that Xi, now that he has a lifetime, uh, a lifetime position, uh, probably can be much more patient than President Trump, who uh, we don't know what tomorrow will bring. Um, but react a little bit to that and to the possibility for conflict as a result of this. Uh, where do you think the, tr the trade war, if it is a war, it's not a war yet, but where is that heading, for example, in your view? Firstly, a couple of points about theory and then where we stand on trade. Um, historically, I've had no interest in international relations theory, none at all. Uh, I've been a practitioner. Um, and, uh, and the problem with practitioners is that they assume that, of course, they're not affected by anyone else's theoretical assumptions. Of course they are. They just choose not to be conscious of it. Uh, so in my post-political life, I've sought to re-examine some of the theoretical foundations from the heavy bag of intellectual prejudices I've picked up throughout my life uh, and tried to reflect on them. Reflecting on China uh, is a separate question because what I discover, at least in my own research, is here we have a, Marx here we have a Communist Party elite which brings a Marxist intellectual software, dialectics, together with a deeply realist view of balance of power anchored in its military and intelligence and security establishment, together with a liberal internationalist economic establishment headed by the Chinese Central Bank and China's principal private corporations like Alibaba trying to make a name for themselves in the world, together with a foreign policy establishment which has been told by Xi, Xi Jinping to go out and construct a new order in a constructivist sort of way. My overall thesis, therefore, is that the reality of China today breaks out of the box of anyone seeking to establish some coherent, <coughs> universal, uh, theoretical explanation as to what the hell is happening. Of course, our Chinese friends rather like that because it keeps us all guessing. Um, 
But my contention to you all today is it is all these things and not just one uh, that represents the unfolding Chinese, let's call it international personality. Uh, why in the end of my presentation I went for something as arcane uh, as called the English school, for those of you not familiar with it, is that uh, it seeks to, uh, based on European experience, to draw in together these various traditions um, into a single method of explaining a much more complex current international realities. It acknowledges balance of powerism, it acknowledges economic interdependence, it acknowledges that we have to make up rules as we go along, it doesn't accept that we're going to produce a perfect liberal international order when you've got the Americans ignoring it sometimes. Uh, for example, as you said, prospectively over the WTO, the Chinese ignoring it sometimes, for example, the International Court of Justice determination on the South China Sea. Um, and so there's a whole lot of constructing, constructivist work underway as well. So enough said on theory, <coughs> but I've tried to read through the literature on this subject and it's given me a very big headache. Um, and I hope there are brighter people in this room who can enlighten me further on this subject, having read uh, most of it. Let me ask on the bonsai you, point about yeah, trade war, let yeah, me just say yeah, this. I don't know if I agree with Graham about it producing a hot war. Uh, what I can say is that the Chinese conclusion, having spoken to a number of Chinese leaders and think tankers and those who advise the international policy establishment in Beijing over the last month, I was there a few weeks ago, um, <clears throat> again, uh, is that the general conclusion in Beijing is that these elements of US policy, uh, whether it's on North Korea, whether it's on trade, uh, whether it's on the most recent decision on ZTE, um, or as we say in the rest of the English-speaking world, ZTE, um, uh, uh, Xi Jinping's counter uh, message, which was his speech at the uh, last week's China conference on uh, cyber and informi informationization, as the Chinese like to call it, is that we now from the Chinese perspective, beginning to see what they conclude to be a coherent American strategy which, number one, repudiates the idea, finally and formally, of peaceful cooperation, and two, is embarked upon something new and aggressive. Now, the American conclusion about uh, China is, in fact, in mirror form of that. So we are now into, in my argument, a brand new and destabilizing period. Historically, the Chinese would keep all economic questions and security questions in completely different boxes. <clears throat> they would maintain their security interests in one direction while prosecuting their economic interests in another, even if they made no inherent conceptual sense, as we would look at it from the outside world. I think where Graham Allison may be pointing to, and having worked with Graham for 12 months at the Belfast Centre, I know how he thinks, and worked with him a lot on Thucydides' trap, uh, is that he now sees this confluence of, uh, of the joining the dots in Beijing about a new, much more aggressive, forward-leaning American strategy, which has lined up the US military establishment, Pacific Command, the intelligence establishment, um, American corporate interests as well as civil society, uh, even down to Hollywood, in one overall anti-China strategy. Uh, that, I think, is the emerging consensus in Beijing. And that, I think, points in a new and dangerous direction to what we've seen for the last 40 years. I hope that's not right, but uh, I can understand why they might think that. Let me just uh, ask a couple of more questions and then we'll go to the audience. But uh, I. Um, this week in, uh, in Panmunjom, the South Korean and North Korean governments are meeting in, in a summit on Friday. It may produce a peace treaty, finally ending the, the war, the Korean War. Uh, what I'm interested in is, uh, is this, a, is this a, uh, a, an issue which brings more confluence between the U.S. and China? Or what is it that you think China wants to get out of this this process, um, denuclearization, um, 
uh, they're getting the U.S. Uh, forces, the 28,000 that are in South Korea, uh, off the, the peninsula. What is the long-term goal of China, would you imagine, uh, in this process? I think the only productive intellectual paradigm for trying to understand what's happening in North Korea is to see it in terms of overlapping or non-overlapping Venn diagrams of interest. What's the Chinese interest? The Chinese interest in aggregate, I think, is along these lines. One, keep a pro-Chinese ally on your border rather than having a pro-American ally on your border, land border. Um, South Korea is close enough, but with the North Koreans you actually share a land border. And China's history of land borders, given they've got 14 territorial neighbors, has historically been problematic uh, through uh, several hundred years of Chinese history. So there is a deep learning in the Chinese strategic culture which says, uh, in, with my land borders I want someone who's either my ally, my friend, or a neutral, or someone who can be politically manipulated. That's the lessons, enduring lessons of Chinese history. Second, um, <clears throat> as a consequence of that, sorry, second, they'd prefer that that uh, um, pro-Chinese land neighbor uh, did not have nuclear weapons. But in their hierarchy of needs, Maslow would put the first above the second in the way in which they see that. They don't like the North Koreans having nukes, but at the end of the day, if it meant losing uh, North Korea as an ally, they'll always vote for having North Korea as a friend and an ally. Therefore, the Americans correctly deduce that this is not as axiomatic a Chinese interest as it is for the United States. Why? Because you can never conceive of a scenario where the North Koreans would target the Chinese, as opposed to targeting American allied uh, targets either in Northeast Asia or U.S. forces in the region or ultimately continental United States through the use of an ICBM. Um, thirdly, the Chinese interest is if there's to be a reunification of North and South Korea under whatever means, um, that it should not under any circumstances uh, produce a country which is uh, more a hostile to Chinese interests than North Korea is right now. So if there's to be reunification, the Chinese would need to be confident from their view that it was going to be a neutral, non-allied country with the United States and with no U.S. troop presence in the South. Now, if I won't I'll go on further to say what's the American set of concentric circle interests, not concentric, the American Venn diagram of interests, and where does that overlap with the Chinese? Uh, kind of around the second point of the three that I've mentioned, but not necessarily around the first and the third. Draw the one for North Korea and then for South Korea. You get, a, you get an increasingly <coughs> constricted space where the four sets of uh, Venn diagrams actually intersect. That's where diplomacy happens. To try and construct an agreement around that, it's pretty tight. Uh, unfortunately, one of those concentric circles nowadays is the man who lives at Mar-a-Lago and his, uh, his own ego, but uh, that's just an editorial comment. You know, we, we have, uh, I think, justifiably been a bit paranoid about Russian involvement in our elections. Um, even paranoid people have enemies, um, and quite clearly there is concern in Australia that China is very much involved uh, in both in politics and in investment and in other, in other ways. Um, there is this Stephen Walt uh, theory uh, uh, called bandwagoning where a powerful country is going to attract uh, a, a relatively weaker country. I'm not trying to call Australia a weak country. It's a strong in its own way. But um, you've called the we current call government, also. Trumbull's mm -hmm. government, um, uh, as engaging in something you call Chin Chinese jihad. Um, you've been very critical of them for what they've been saying, but is there a threat? Is there a threat that there will be so much influence that uh, the politics of your country will be affected by it? If you follow the logic of what I described before as Xi Jinping's seven concentric circles of, shall I say, worldview and interest, it follows a logical extension at least of the uh, uh, the fifth of those, 
which is China's uh, maritime periphery in East Asia and the West Pacific, that it would want, in, through its uh, extension of economic influence, a more <coughs> compliant, uh, economically, politically, and foreign policy terms, compliant East Asia than is currently the case. The deep historical resonances in the Chinese tradition is the history of tributary states in both the Ming and the Qing dynasty. I'm not saying that uh, the current Chinese le leadership wishes to replicate a tributary state model, but that's the historical learning about how you maintain order with, shall we say, maritime partners. Um, and there's a, a long and rich history of this, uh, whether it's tribute being delivered from Seoul uh, or from um, uh, Vietnam or from the various Khmer kingdoms of uh, Southeast Asia, the Malay states, and even across to the Arab world. Uh, there's a long history of this. And so it follows as a matter of logic uh, that China, whether it's directly influenced by its history on that, or uh, through simply the power of its economic diplomacy, but most acutely, the sheer scale of the Chinese economy, which dominates everything in East Asia, given that it's uh, second in the world only to the United States, uh, that the Chinese uh, network of influence grows bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. That's what I describe as an empirical reality. And China, um, like uh, other states, will therefore seek to obtain as much influence within those countries as possible, uh, either through direct economic engagement, through uh, its own uh, activities within elements of their own diaspora, uh, its influence over Chinese language newspapers, etc. Mm -hmm. My argument against um, uh, Prime Minister Trumbull uh, or Turnbull, uh, depending on <laughs> whose name you apply, uh, is uh, is that each of these, uh, as it were, factors, whether they are uh, domestic to Australia or in our immediate region are quite capable of being dealt with through the existing means available to Australian uh, politics, um, law enforcement, foreign investment rules, uh, and the way in which we just do business as a nation. Like we're a country which has dealt with waves of British migration, British investment, waves of American investment, waves of Japanese investment, waves of Korean investment. We've been doing this for about 150 years. We're kind of used to it. This is just the latest wave. And so how do you deal with it? By using the laws that we have available domestically concerning uh, the autonomy of our political parties, laws r relating to campaign finance, uh, laws relating to uh, freedom of the press, laws relating to competition policy and there being an open and free media, laws relating in a non-discriminatory basis to foreign investment, uh, laws which protect the core na national economic interests of the country, as well as our normal criminal law, which is as vast and as expensive and, frankly, extensive and as complex as your bloody criminal law in this country, which I still don't understand. Right. Um, and so as a consequence, you put all those things together, we have the capacity to handle these challenges. The question is whether you have national politicians who want to elevate that to a point where it becomes a domestic political crusade, a little more sophisticated than McCarthyism and Reds Under the Beds, which we've been through in this country in the 1950s, and its resonances elsewhere in the Western world in the 50s and 60s as well. I don't think that's smart. I think it creates more problems than it solves, and that's why I have um, repeatedly attacked Prime Minister Trumbull. Um, uh, over this in, uh, in recent weeks because I just don't think it's an intelligent way of dealing with, uh, let's call it, this uh, challenge, logical, natural challenge arising from China's expanded influence in the region. Mm -hmm. Let's open it up. Um, we have questions for uh, the Prime Minister. There's one over there. It seems like since uh, our president's early visit to Trump in Florida, he's figured out how to orchestrate this entire North Korean, China, American world interaction to perhaps to everybody's benefit, but perhaps more to his benefit. What do you think? You mean for President Trump's benefit? For the, for every, for the world's benefit, but more for China's benefit. It seems like she is a very bright guy and, and the orchestra leader 
of everything ha that's happened. I think um, the way I look at it is, I think it's fair to say that to the extent that President Trump has a strategy towards China, um, I think he has a series of impulses towards China, which in aggregate form end up being a sort of strategy. And his strategy is uh, be tough, uh, demand outcomes, whether they are in economic and security terms, and hope that it works. <laughs> I think that's about it. <laughs> now, that's okay. That's a strategy. Uh, it's different to the one that's been deployed in the past, and he would say, therefore, it's better. That's his argument. Now, on the other side, you have a Chinese state, uh, which is steeped in uh, decades of uh, strategic experience in dealing with the Soviet Union and dealing with the United States pre-Nixon, the United States post-Nixon, um, hostile environments uh, around it, uh, with no natural allies in the world apart from the crazy North Koreans. Um, and so Chinese statecraft and strategy is a highly sophisticated industry. Uh, people who work on this within the Chinese system, in my experience, are very smart. They study the world acutely. Uh, they don't always get the conclusions right, or what we would say in an objective sort of way, uh, but it's a very sophisticated apparatus. Now, when that apparatus looks at Trump, they see two things. One, they see enormous strategic opportunity. Why? Because Trump, as they see it, is trashing the democratic brand, not the party, the philosophy, uh, both at home and abroad. And that the whole notion of the integrity of Western liberal democracy has taken a big hit around the head as a consequence of A, the method of Trump's election, and B, shall I say, the manner with which he's executed political office. That's my sort of neutral, yes. neutral way of expressing it. But on top of that... I think execution is a good word. Yeah, yeah. But on top of that, um, the Chinese not only sense strategic opportunity, with that, they see strategic opportunity with him trashing America's brand in international climate change negotiations and with trashing America's brand prospectively in the integrity of the international rules-based order on trade. Now, these are two areas where traditionally America has been strong uh, and is now on the back foot. So they see a triple opportunity in the world. Uh, our authoritarianism in China is suddenly looking a bit rosier compared with the chaos of the American and broader Western democratic experiment. Uh, B, the Americans have trashed their climate change brand, and C, they are trashing their trade brand as the architects and the patron saints of global free trade. Now, to conclude, on the reverse side of the agenda, the Chinese, however, are anxious. Uh, the anxiety hinges on one thing, and that is Trump's, Trump's enormous uh, strategic unpredictability. That is, they observe carefully Tweetland. They observe carefully the fact that positions are ditched within 24 hours. Kill the TPP, reopen the TPP, kill it again. That was in three days, um, as just one recent example. But the strategic message which our Chinese friends take from that is that nothing can therefore be assumed about the predictability of President Trump's behavior in the event of a real security crisis arising over North Korea, over the Taiwan Straits or in the South China Sea, or the real predictability of Trump's actions if, in fact, we end up in not just a rhetorical trade war, but a real one, where the measures which have been debated so far and announced are actually allowed to take effect, which is in some cases a matter of only six weeks away. So reality is a complex mix of these three elements. Uh, the Trump strategy, as I've just described it, uh, the Chinese seeing this as full of a, a period of continuing strategic opportunity, which is a term the Chinese net use, and replete with risks because of Trump's own unpredictability. Thank you.
Um, sorry, I just have a quick question. Thank you very much for your um, talk. And so you've kind of looked at this from a pretty high macro international level, which is understandable because we're in the IR department. But I was wondering if you could comment on the way in which the Chinese... I can do low as well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I've been in Australian politics. We can yeah. go very low if you'd like. Yeah. Um, if you could comment on the way in which the Chinese government is forming, the way in which it forms its Chinese citizens. So with the, I haven't read too much about this, but the way in which it's giving kind of social points to its citizens now, how they're trying, uh, just to comment on the way in which that aligns with the seven concentric circles, she's seven con concentric circles, as well as how that um, contributes to its politics in general. Yeah, it's Here, yeah. concentric circle number one um, in the hierarchy of needs. It's about the future power of the party. And so it deals with the party's relationship with the citizenry. And so through per medium of the new technologies, you now have um, uh, not just, shall we say, good old credit ratings delivered by the Bank of America based on whether you paid your mortgage a few times last year, um, but now much more active and immediate credit ratings, financial credit ratings, given the explosion of Alibaba and, um, and uh, the other pl platforms including JD, so that you have credit profiles now on uh, much of the citizenry, hundreds of millions, which also then, because of the nature of the Chinese political system, where there are no privacy laws, become available to the state. Move on from that, these technologies now also, uh, through multiple applications, are able to provide social, uh, let's call it, ratings of China's citizenry by tracking all of your WeChat conversations, I use WeChat as well, uh, which is Chinese, um, what would you call it? Um, uh, Snap, not Snapchat, it'd be Chinese. Um, Instagram. Uh, WhatsApp, Chinese WhatsApp, yeah, I use WhatsApp too. Um, I use so many app what's that you gets confusing. Uh, Twitter, Weibo, um, WeChat, WhatsApp. Uh, no one would have known what that sentence meant 10 years ago, but the, um, but the bottom line is, uh, because of their ability to capture so much data, uh, you now have, um, as you said, uh, social rating scores, which is, ah, this is all terrific, uh, good contributor to the local community. Uh, but we do note there have been two um, postings by you, uh, either on Weibo uh, or on, in WeChat exchanges, uh, which have uh, mentioned the words um, Dalai Lama. Oh, this is not good. Um, and so um, that is where it's going. You add to that what's now unfolding in, com in parts of China like uh, Xinjiang with the application of facial recognition technologies. Uh, you see a further aggregation in the capacity of the Chinese state empowered by the new technologies to have much more comprehensive, rolling, up-to-date, uh, mobile, tactically deployable, profiles on the entire citizenry, or 1.4 billion over time, and the rest of the world as well, um, depending on how we engage those Chinese systems. And so that's a matter for Chinese citizens, uh, but you ask where it fits in the Maslovian hierarchy, it's number one, the future power of the party in a Leninist system. So someone on the back there, uh, Paul. We have an overflow group, so everybody use a microphone. <coughs> Please identify Hello, yourself. Hello, overflow you people, know. wherever you are. Yes, right, yeah. upstairs. Upstairs. Um, yeah, thank you, Prime Minister, for visiting Brown. I'm a sophomore here. Good. Um, yeah, and so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, still young. Sophomore, um, is that f fancy American talk for second year? Uh, yeah, I guess. Okay, yeah, on, yeah. yeah. Also, I'm also from Korea, so it's a okay, fancy good. American term. Um, but anyway, my question is, so we've talked a little bit about um, China's interest in North Korea, especially with the developing um, summit between the two Korean leaders. But how would that kind of change these, uh, China's interest uh, in its relationship with South Korea? So since, like, uh, since North Korea, a Korea that is more um, conducive to Chinese ideology or Chinese thoughts is trying to normalize and come into the international order. Would that kind of shift um, China-South Korea relationship and make China prioritize um, North Korea over South Korea, or how would that unfold? Thank you. Well, let me just answer that by <clears throat> going to 
this major event which will happen this Friday, which is the Inter-Korean Summit at Panmunjom. Um, and uh, I do not believe we should uh, be dismissive of it in advance. I think we should be uh, cautious, careful, but open-minded about what it produces. Um, um, I'm always been someone who pays attention to the importance of diplomacy, uh, but always a realist diplomacy, which is what can we produce out of this which is substantive, but most importantly, enforceable. So, go to the summit. Item one, uh, what, is the re what does the South and what does the rest uh, of the West, uh, led by the United States, want? <coughs> denuclearization of the North. Second, what does that mean? Does it mean um, cessation of production of nuclear material at a minimum? Uh, does it mean the cessation of testing at a minimum? Does it mean the removal of existing nuclear weapons at a minimum? Uh, does it mean the removal of uh, short, medium and long range rocketry? missile capabilities, ballistic missile capabilities? Yes. So the practical question is which of those sub boxes are ticked, if any, and what is the timetable for their removal, and what is the verification of that, given we've been round this racetrack a few times before in debates uh, about North Korea's nuclear potential since 1994, when they first cheated. On the other side of the agenda, it's what does North Korea want? And to be very brutal about that as well. What do they want? They want an end of uh, all international economic sanctions. Um, they want security guarantee for their regime so they can continue uh, t to maintain their peculiar form of a one-party state, which is also an inherited feudal system. Uh, handed on from grandfather to father to son, um, coming out of the mystical forces of some strange mountain in the north of the country, where according to North Korean mythology, they all emerged in the ancient recesses of time. It's kind of weird when you think about it. The, um, certainly something I couldn't have got elected on in Australia. But uh, um, the, um, uh, and then thirdly, uh, the, um, um, what does it mean in terms of uh, an economic, uh, let's call it rescue package for North Korea, which is uh, capable of rapidly modernizing the, the North Korean economy? Fourthly, what do they want in terms of inter-Korean union, if anything, at this stage? And fifthly, um, uh, what verification do they want that their security needs, their international guarantees of their future regime and national security will in fact be honoured. So if I was being brutal uh, and Germanic about the way in which I'd line up the two sets of lists of Maslovian needs, it's kind of those. So where will they get? I'm not sure, my friend. Um, I think where they'll get is some broad agreed generic statement about the centrality of <coughs> denuclearization and about the normalization of the uh, North Korean relationship with the South and the United States through the formal negotiation of a peace treaty and through um, the uh, and that everything else is then staged in steps of negotiations with officials in the uh, weeks and months that follow with verification procedures attached. Will it work? Look, I'm not a betting man because um, I always lose when I bet. Um, but the bottom line is, given all that's working against this, it's got about a one in four chance of turning into something. And so therefore I believe you've got to give it a go. Um, but we should be very mindful of the three and four factor, which is based on a history of North Korean cheating uh, on these sort of agreements in the past. Let's take a couple more. Yeah, okay. Uh, 
Hi, uh, my name is Jia Hong. Um, I am a student here at Brown. Um, and so with regard to your kind of political thought and how it's deeply rooted in history and um, as some of somewhat of a historian myself I, I, I kind of see so so you mentioned how uh, historically like Chinese uh, political power is deeply rooted in hierarchy and privilege and they don't see um, they, they don't see a reason for getting rid of that in the future and then also um, this Marxist uh, Leninist elites don't Mm. Sorry? My point is that political elites don't see the need to get rid of that. Okay. Um, I guess because, because this um, infiltration or kind of wide, widespread study of Leninist Marcus, Marxism in China is more of a product um, in the early 20th century when, uh, for instance, like Deng Xiaoping and then uh, Zhou Enlai and all these people went to um, study in France. Um, and that kind of had a heavy influence on their la later political careers. Um, and so that was also kind of a period in China when China was vastly exposing itself to Western ideas. Uh, but, but certain forms took root in China, but others did not. Mm. So how do you see this kind of development um, in which China was very much going out to the West and then learning Western ideas? but took on instead certain ideologies but not others and how do you see this like moving forward you know in the 21st century how would the Chinese political views um, uh, evolve? These are very large questions my friend um, um, and I'm not Chinese and so it's very hard for me to answer. Uh, I've worked on China for the last 35 or 40 years I've lived there, I've worked there, I read Chinese, I follow the debates to the extent that I can. I've got many Chinese friends, but I know the limitations of my knowledge um, and certainly my ability to predict. <clears throat> Two or three quick points though. One, why did they adopt Marxism? Um, uh, he was a Westerner, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I blame the British Library. That's where yes. he did all his work. <laughs> the, uh, and, uh, if they only provided better refreshments at lunchtime, we wouldn't have ended up with uh, Dutch Capital. <laughs> he would have written right. comedy instead. But um, uh, that was not a serious point, I'm sorry. The, um, I think um, if you look at the, uh, yeah, the great Chinese intellectual ferment uh, from the end of the Qing, uh, and right from the period of you know, Tan Setung and Kang Yao Wei and Liang Qichao and that period from basically 1890 to 1920, uh, Chinese, the new Chinese intellectual class, let's call it the May the Fourth Movement, um, uh, Wu Se, uh, in 1919, they were looking uh, for a way out of China's national dilemma, twofold. Uh, it's collapsing imperial structure which had failed so demonstrably to keep the West out uh, through what happened from the Opium Wars on in the 1840s, the Second Opium Wars, the 1860s, and then um, the uh, Ihe Tuan in 1999-1900, uh, <coughs> that there was this, and then the uh, calamity of the, uh, the First World War, not in terms of loss of Chinese lives, but in terms of the failure of the peace conference to deliver back uh, to China German territory instead to cede it to Japan. There's this huge intellectual ferment which is basically how do we jiu guo? How do we save the country? I get that. If I was Chinese, I get that. Um, and if you come from an ancient and continuing civilization of its remarkable achievements uh, going back 3,000 years, um, then you'd feel this doubly, deeply, culturally, personally, individually. I get that too. Um, and so, so in comes uh, an intellectual framework to make sense of not just class war but uh, colonial exploitation, which is international class war. And suddenly this intellectual paradigm made a lot of sense to Chinese intellectuals at the time. Why did it prevail, not just its intellectual elegance, uh, but because through Leninist parties coming out of uh, the organisational methods of the Soviet Party, which had succeeded, of course, in 1917, in the Bolshevik Revolution. 
and progressively through to 1922, is that you had organisation, Lenin, and what then shall we do? Not just have a seminar, let's go and organise and you know, burn down the state, which is what he did. Uh, so they had this real living example together with a coherent worldview, a Xu Jie Guan, um, uh, which enabled them to form a political movement with an ideological program which to some extent they adopted to Chinese circumstances because of the role of the peasantry as opposed to the urban proletariat, and they prevailed. Liberal intellectuals, the other ones who, who were examined, uh, most particularly through the agency of people like Liang Qichao, and, um, and the applicability of liberal intellectual models, Hu Shi and the rest of them, to China's domestic circumstances. Um, when applied to the Chinese state through the imperfect mechanism of the nationalist government under Chiang Kai-shek in the 20s and 30s, uh, these were perhaps never given proper opportunity to succeed because of the Japanese invasion, because of the Japanese invasion, but because also of the depth of corruption within the nationalist regime. A couple of factors combined. So they're the historical determinants, I think. Um, when you turn to the future, and let's call it the future of ideas shaping China's future uh, and where it wants to be at home and abroad, it's very difficult to know out of the current ferment what will ultimately prevail. I suppose given the wreckage which the party inflicted on the Chinese people through the Dao uh, and through the Wenhua Dao Gaming, uh, the party for 40 years has been in a repair mode, repairing its historical credibility, having almost destroyed the country uh, between 1959 and 1976. Um, now that's achieved, and while the Chinese public may not be in love with the party, I think they respect its achievements um, in terms of what's been delivered on living standards and China's role in the world today. Um, and that is a reasonable thing for the party to feel proud about and for Chinese people to fe feel proud about. But for the future, uh, the great intellectual question is what then fills the ideas vacuum within the country? I run into very few young Chinese around the world or in China today who says, I'm just brimming full of Marxist idealism. Uh, you know, I haven't met one. Uh, and I've met more of them in the West these days than I, that I meet in China. <laughs> Um, and then you say, so what are you brimming full with? And they'll say, I'm brimming full uh, of uh, materialism. Thank you very much. I want to have ten houses. I want to have five cars. Uh, I want to have three passports and, uh, and a partridge in a pear tree. And, uh, and uh, terrible Western joke for those of you who didn't get it. But, um, <laughs> the, um, uh, and so, but then the theoreticians are saying, but hang on. Uh, that's just creating a total values vacuum uh, because we have Marxist materialism being replaced with capitalist materialism. Um, at least the Marxists believed in a code of morality of some sorts which was about, let's call it, social justice um, delivered by revolutionary means, albeit. And so hence the great search, so hence the retreat into the Chinese tradition. Let's uh, breathe some more life back into Kong uh, um, Confucius uh, and let's have uh, a new form of Confucianism which is not just about hierarchy but it's about classical Confucian Tao De as well and so it's uh, uh, and you see the the Guang Gao the the, uh, the, uh, the billboards around Beijing advertising classical Chinese virtues and values now I get all of that um, but where does that take you is that simply a mask for continued Chinese authoritarianism or is it towards some other political destination? And that, my friend, lies in your hands, not mine. Yeah, I uh, think that's a wonderful place to end. And I, uh, we, because the Prime Minister has to get up to Boston College, uh, and there may be traffic. But let me just say this, as you were speaking, and, and you preceded what you said with uh, a statement of humility about how little you know about China, because you're not Chinese. And I say this for Americans here in this audience, and that is that you know, we are losing this kind of capacity, the kind of knowledge of history, of culture, uh, 
of the language uh, and of the system, the political system that exists in China, in our State Department today. The U.S. State Department is being just absolutely uh, killed in terms of its uh, effectiveness. I remember the days when we lost a lot of our Soviet experts, our Russian uh, speakers, uh, and this is, this is devastating. I would like to think that um, our electoral system, based on an electoral college and president running separately, could produce the kind of prime minister or president that we have here, a person with so much knowledge of the way the world works. Um, but if we don't have a system, a parliamentary system, that, that places a premium on that kind of knowledge, which most parliamentary systems do, I'll never forget introducing the Canadian prime minister um, uh, at a, a speech out at the Humphrey School and basically uh, listen, uh, listening to myself talk about the various ministries in which he served in before becoming prime minister. He was prepared to become a prime minister, and you were certainly prepared not only because of your experience in the parliament, but because of your diplomatic experience as well. I think we need to be thinking about this, and if we can't elect presidents with that kind of knowledge. They might have a knowledge of other things, but we certainly need to surround them with people who have this kind of diplomatic skill. It's been very, very impressive, uh, Kevin. I appreciate so much your coming here and sharing your views, and keep it up, because you are building bridges, building a bridge, a, a very important bridge between the United States and, uh, and not only Australia, but China. And that's going to be increasingly important as, as the years uh, go by. Thank you so much. Thank you. And just as I go and uh, make my way to Boston, I still can't pronounce that name, <laughs> wherever it is. Red Sox. Yeah, Red Sox territory. Yeah. <laughs> the, um, the land of the Red Sox is, uh, is uh, for those of you who are young in the business of studying uh, China and studying international relations, uh, keep at it. You know, uh, the world needs you. Uh, it's going to get more complex, not less. And so the more of you who are mainstreamed, if it's either in corporate life or political life or in bureaucratic life or in diplomatic life, the better. Mm -hmm. um, and it does require a hang of a lot of discipline, a hang of a lot of perseverance. But, you know, people make the difference. Um, we're not passive pawns in the hands of an immobile, f sorry, an immovable force of history. Uh, you're all active agents in shaping the future. Uh, and people like yourselves, uh, can move the dial in a big way. So, young people of America, young people of China, go, go to it. Mm. Absolutely. Very good. <laughs>